Good evening and welcome to our evening prayer for Good Friday here, uh, brought to you from St Andrews, Hawkness Gurn here in Darlington. Um, we hope you've had a good day, um, a reflective day as well, and uh, whatever you've been doing, you're welcome now, and we invite you to spend the next 20 minutes or so with us in reflection, in prayer, in thought and in response to what this day means to anyone who wants to follow Jesus Christ. So um, as you'll see in the post, we've, um, uh, we've got a slightly different format for this evening. We're going to be using loosely the order of service for uh, night prayer that you can find at the link on the Church of England prayer page uh, for daily prayer. Um, and we've got three readings which are in order um, John chapter 19 verses 1 to 42 um, and then um, Isaiah um, 52 verse 13 to chapter 53 verse 12 and then finishing with Hebrews or not finishing actually but uh, the last reading is from Hebrews chapter 10 verses 16 to 25 um, we don't have a psalm this evening but we are going to read the Isaiah reading in canon like we do for a psalm so I invite you to join in that and um, uh, and reflect, use that to reflect on the prophecies behind what Jesus did today. So uh, hopefully you've uh, got a candle. Um, I decided to move it from the windowsill because I thought it would be closer for today, um, but I'm not sure it's actually working. So uh, forgive me while I try and actually just bring it up a little bit more to see. I think that's probably just about high enough for you to see on the screen. So uh, hopefully you can, hopefully you've got your candle because um, it's a very important day today in our lives as Christians and um, we've been faithfully using our candle um, since New Year's Day, since Christmas tide, to reflect on that light in the darkness and that hope that Jesus brings. And of course it has even more powerful significance today so hopefully you've been able to remember your candle because we're going to use it in a number of special ways this evening so welcome Kath welcome Jane welcome Lynn it's great to have you all here and everybody else who may not have posted yet so I don't quite know who you are but it's lovely to have so many of us here now in this space to give ourselves time to reflect on today so I'm going to turn to our opening sentence which I've chosen today from a Good Friday hymn because I think it's the most powerful way to start this evening and it's from When I Survey the Wondrous Cross Love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all I invite you now as we come to a time of reflection which we're going to make tonight mainly to light the candle now as we've done every Friday as a symbol of Christ coming into the world bringing light and life and hope hopefully you can see that I'm aware that obviously with the clocks now moving back or forward rather um, you know, for the first time this Friday, we actually have daylight for our seven o'clock evening prayer, which is great, but it does make the candle slightly less powerful, but hopefully you can see it flickering as I can here. And hopefully yours at home, where you are, is just still projecting that image of Christ bringing light and hope to the world, vulnerable in human form. So I invite you to spend just a few moments reflecting on those things, light, hope, vulnerability, as we bring today before him. you to share with 
our Lord now those things have been on your mind and heart maybe you've had time to reflect on the proceedings of today or maybe you've been at work maybe you've been preoccupied with family things with relationship things I invite you to give them all to God now to empty our minds and Lord take us over bring us into your presence for now we are your servants at the foot of your cross I want you to stay in that sense of reflection as we now read together John chapter 19 verses 1 through to 42 which is from Pilate flogging Jesus through to his death and burial and I'm going to invite you at the right point to blow out the candle John chapter 19 Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look! I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realise I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat in a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was a day of preparation for the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. So finally Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but, this man, but that this man claimed 
to be king of the Jews? Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was a day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead they did not break his legs. Instead one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given his testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. And as another scripture said, they will look on the one they have pierced. Later, Joseph of Joseph of Arimathea and asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. When, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. I invite you to turn to the order of service now and just say together the words of the Song of Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis, which is uh, part of the way down, with an opening sentence and a closing, an opening response and a closing response for today. Because the Song of Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis, has an echo for today when we read the words. So together, let's say, Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people. A light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Together we say, Christ himself bore our sins on his body on the tree, 
that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Because this day of all days is so pivotal in the whole of the story of salvation, woven through all of God's interaction with us mere humans. As it was prophesied, as it says in John several times, it refers to the scriptures. Um, and nowhere more in the Old Testament those scriptures real than in Isaiah. So we're going to read that together now um, in canon. Um, I'll read the odd verses starting at verse 13, chapter 52, right the way through to chapter 53, verse 12. And I invite you to join in on the even verses. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were, uh, who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After all he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I gave this evening the theme, It's All About Me. Because it is. It's all about me and it's all about you. And it's all about every and each one of us on this planet. That's what Good Friday is. It's all about what we did and how we could not come back to God. And yet God so loved us and so loves us now that he chose the only option he could see 
of deep, powerful, sacrificial love through the sacrifice of his own son in our place to bring us back to him, to pay the debt that we owe. I always wondered when and how salvation happened when I was first becoming, a, when I first became a Christian. And I call myself a crucifixion Christian as much as a, as much as a resurrection Christian. Because I used to think Easter Sunday was redemption. Today, however, is when it happened. Today is when our sins were paid for. We were redeemed. The price for our sins, for our failures, for who we are, who we weren't and who we haven't been, is cleared. Irredeemably cleared. Gone. Because of today. That's why it's Good Friday. Really not good for our loved Lord Jesus but through the goodness of his father and the faithfulness he showed it's good for us because he's given us the way back to God forever Easter Sunday shows that you can't keep a good man down that sin and death is defeated through that sacrifice. But let's not dwell on that now. Let's instead turn to Hebrews and just read the Hebrews passage because this says what happens next. Why that redemption means something to us today. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 16 to 25. This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And not giving up meeting each other, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. We are now in an inextricably unbreakable bond with our Lord God again through today through Jesus love and sacrifice sprinkled clean washed pure transformed through that to do all love and good deeds because it is all about me and you and each and every one of us. It's about how we can be redeemed and choose to be transformed. And that's the other message to look forward to for Sunday. Let's turn and say together as we move into a short time of prayer to close this evening by saying together the Lord's Prayer. After which, I invite us all to have a moment of silence and reflect on the most powerful gift that you've ever been given. And then we'll close with the prayer um, from the order of service, the middle one, 
starting Almighty God as we stand. But let's say together the Lord's Prayer now. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's close our time together by saying the prayer from the order of service. Together we say, Almighty God, as we stand at the foot of the cross of your Son, help us to see and know your love for us, so that in humility, love and joy we may place at his feet all that we have and all that we are through Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. I invite you to spend the rest of this Good Friday in that assurance of redemption through the sacrificial love and redemption through our Lord Jesus Christ to remember his sacrifice was all for you and me and each and every one of us that chooses whether or not we choose or not to believe actually it's still there for us but if we choose to believe that redemption that love, that closeness of relationship with God again is there, inextricable, unbreakable. And I invite you to hold on to that and to ponder that in your heart for the next day or so. Because as a great evangelist once said, because Sunday is coming, and I look forward to lighting the candle again. God bless you all.